Hi all, it's Milo. I consider myself an organizer and a scholar of social justice. So thinking and writing about the prison and police state that I live in uh, comes up frequently in my life, even when we're not in the middle of an international uprising against the police. But what we have seen over the past few weeks has been a massive increase in the percentage of people who see police brutality as an issue. I know from talking to my own family members who were once having conversations about whether or not Michael Brown stole cigarettes before he was murdered and are now outraged at police brutality that you know, political consciousness on this issue is shifting quite dramatically. What has been really interesting for me to see is that even though there are a lot of people who are voicing that they see an issue with the police in the United States, there are still a lot of calls for reformist solutions, shall we say, that still keep the police force and criminal justice in place. I have listened to so many people acknowledge that policing in the United States constitutes systemic racism, but then propose solutions that recreate the same violent systems. We are collectively so used to policing in prisons that we are caught up on the assumption that having these systems in place is necessary for a society to function. Falsely taking prisons as a necessity prevents a lot of people from seeing the reasons why prisons were built in the first place and from imagining a world without prisons. I know that there's a lot of people who are voicing their opinions on this right now that you could be listening to, but I want to offer a brief argument about really what convinced me to become an abolitionist, kind of my journey into how I first understood abolition, as well as some reasons why I think reformist solutions represent a lack of imagination that I really think needs to be brought to abolitionist conversations. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means of all the reasons why I think we need abolition and reforms that will bring us to abolition, but this is what feels necessary for me to contribute in this moment. Editing Milo here, just wanted to pop in and add before I get into the video, the names of some of the leaders and scholars who have helped me get to where I am today in terms of understanding abolition to credit and give thanks to them. I believe that the first abolitionist text that I read was Angela Davis's Are Prisons Obsolete? Afterwards, I have received political education from Frank Chapman, who is the executive director of the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, and he is a formerly incarcerated political prisoner himself. I've been really lucky to be able to share community with him and learn from him a lot personally, and he is also an author. I have learned about transformative justice from Adrian Marie Brown, and I have picked up some restorative justice tools from Tomas Ramirez and the writings of other indigenous leaders. I have studied the black radical tradition in part from the writings of Charlene Carruthers and Kathy Cohen. And I am continuing to try and push myself to take my understanding of abolition back to its more radicalized roots through uh, scholarship by Joy James and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. I will link to some of these authors in the description and I would recommend checking them out. I'm really trying to develop ways of communicating my ideas to people who believe that policing is systemic racism, but who see, you know, a solution to that through anything other than totally stopping the use of policing in prisons. It's important to know that the police didn't suddenly start disproportionately perpetrating violence against poor people of color since Stop and Frisk or Rodney King or the war on drugs. Like, Policing in the U.S. originated with white vigilantes enforcing laws that protected slavery and criminalized runaway slaves. Policing has always disproportionately targeted people of color and protected white property owners. That's nothing new. That is the function of the system. There is no way to reform the police system in the U.S. because it is doing exactly what it was designed to do. I think that the current conversation about abolishing the police is lacking in a lot of ways because we can't talk about abolishing the police without also explicitly talking about abolishing prisons. We know that there will always be an institution to arrest and surveil people if there are still prison beds to fill. So we also have to acknowledge that prisons are not necessary they cause additional harm to communities and 
they don't rehabilitate people or keep communities safe. We know that prisons aren't rehabilitating people when the recidivism rates for people within their first year after release is 44% and 83% within nine years after release. Prisons aren't preventing crimes because the threat of punishment does nothing to keep communities safe. It does nothing to prevent crime. It does not work. Some of the first conversations I had about abolition were through refuting carceral feminism, which makes it seem like women will be safer if only we could incarcerate rapists. Criminal justice frames wrongs committed in terms of broken laws, not harm done to communities. So there is really no encouragement of accountability or repairing harm. Like when it benefits people to plead not guilty to crimes, even if you know they did do the crime, like there is no chance to take accountability. As of sending people to jail is the only way that we have to repair harms done to communities. As a people who have done harm are incapable of you know, doing anything to repair that harm. A survivor of violence may feel better knowing that their attacker is incarcerated, but like I can only imagine the trauma of having to sit through a trial and hear your attacker like claim no wrongdoing. Like that has to be another source of harm. Carceral feminism is also hypocritical because it mostly ignores the sexual violence perpetrated in prisons against incarcerated people, which is an issue that really greatly affects queer people who are incarcerated. I think to add to this point that I'm making here, my partner suggested I add the critique, uh, naming this as neoliberal feminism. I think that is a very accurate critique because carceral feminism frames the issue of sexual violence that is justified in our culture and widespread in terms of fixing it by locking up individuals and encouraging individuals to bring up cases against their rapists. Carceral feminism identifies the issue as individual acts of violence, which is pretty inaccurate because even pop feminists use the word rape culture to describe how like there is a culture of justifying rape that like even if we locked up all of the rap rapists in the world, we would still see acts of sexual violence happening because it's not just a few bad apples. It is like the way that we teach about consent and sexual violence and bodily autonomy. Just how widespread sexual violence is, is indicative of the fact that it's not going to be solved by incarcerating people. Because if we incarcerated everyone who's ever committed acts of sexual violence, that would be an enormous amount of people. That is clearly not a plausible solution. And so we need to think of ways to actually prevent that violence rather than incarcerating individuals. That takes looking at ways that we can prevent sexual violence within communities and like recognizing what are the other systems at play in our culture that like justify this violence and that lead to crimes. Maybe not super specific to sexual violence, but in terms of talking about abolition, we also need to be naming systems such as capitalism, for example, that create conditions of poverty where crimes are committed. We can't have abolition if we're not also talking about deconstructing capitalism and like these other systems at play that are like creating the conditions for violence to happen. Instead, I believe in restorative and transformative justice because I believe communities can be made safer with solutions that do prevent crime, like funding public health and education. I believe that sexual and other forms of violence can be prevented through restorative justice approaches that help people who have caused harm to see the harm that they have caused and to change their behaviors, which we know is not happening in the criminal justice system. That is not what prisons are for. Transformative justice is an approach to addressing harm through trying to change the actual root causes of that harm. And restorative justice is kind of the same thing, but specifically as an alternative to the criminal justice system. We wouldn't see prisons as necessary to protect communities from all of the supposed bad people out there if we actually funded programs that helped prevent the conditions where crimes are committed in in the first place. This gets to how we need to think critically about whether or not prisons are necessary too. And I think that takes looking at the formation of the prison industrial complex and exactly how that process happened. It's not just that private prisons are the issue because most prisons are state funded since it's easier to get funding for prisons and corrections than it is to get funding for social programs that would actually Get rid of the need for prisons. Correctional officer unions are really powerful and have helped secure the construction of prisons in order to create jobs. But I know that there are also people who work on the inside of prisons who 
also really believe in how flawed the system is. My dad used to work in a prison as a psychologist and really generations of my family have worked in relation to criminal justice in various different ways. Most of my family is from a really rural area where prisons constitute a large part of the economy and the jobs that are available. But I think there's also, you know, it's also useful to just think about how the existence of prisons in, in rural areas or in urban areas is very, normalized that like you just live in a town where there's a prison and that's just a part of everyday life and you know then people get to think we can't have a world without prisons because prisons are just a staple. I really believe that it is unsuccessful to try and change the system from inside by working in prisons. While I'm really critical of that approach and I am aware that people who work in prisons are also implicit in that violence in some ways, um, I know that my dad is well-meaning and he thought that he could help people. And through conversations with him, I know that he still acknowledges the wrong and the violence that he saw perpetrated against people who were incarcerated. I know that he thinks of prison abolition as a pretty far off ideal, but I think the fact that people who work and have worked within prisons see the system failing is pretty indicative of the fact that we need to start imagining alternative worlds where we don't have prisons. Restorative justice alternatives are already taking place on a small scale. The Restorative Justice Community Court in Chicago is working with young people to repair harms within their communities instead of sending them to prison. Other abolitionist reforms that are taking place are working to stop the construction of new prisons and working to reduce the prison population nationally. Abolition is a really big part of my politics and my vision for social justice. I think especially because I got brought into leftist politics around the time and through viewing the uprising um, in Ferguson in 2014. I'm really drawn into abolition because I think that transformative justice really aligns with my values. I think about my experience as a survivor of sexual violence and I ask like, what, what did I really need after that happened? I think my answer is restorative justice and some type of community accountability. I do not think that any type of punitive response would have benefited me in any way. And I think I intentionally like did not seek out any support at the time because I thought that punishment was the only option. I also really strongly believe in following the leadership of currently and formerly incarcerated people. I know that the abolitionist movement has sort of been de-radicalized over time because it has been brought into academia and away from its grassroots start through the organizing of black currently and formerly incarcerated people. So it's really important to me to ground my abolitionist work within that radical history and try to get away from reformist approaches as much as I can. I am a member of Black and Pink's pen pal group um, and that's a great way to get involved in supporting incarcerated LGBT people if that is something that interests you. I have found other ways to get involved in person too. Really fundamentally, I believe that there is no justice in the justice system. And you know, if, if transformative justice doesn't convince you of that, um, I went to several Pack the Court events for Gerald Reed, who is an incarcerated man who was convicted on a false confection that he was tortured into giving. Um, and he's been incarcerated for 30 years. And he just had a, a court process drawn out over the past year that just ended in a decision that he is not gonna be given a retrial. This system is, is massively harming people. I would say it's broken, but it's really, <laughs> Uh, you know, has been like this for a while, was never really functional, um, but this is not a way that we can get justice. And I think it's really important to be talking about abolition right now. If you want to support currently and formerly incarcerated black and indigenous, trans and gender non-conforming people, I'm gonna link a fundraiser down below. And I'm also going to include a different list of resources on abolition. If that is something that you would like to do more reading on, I would recommend that you do. I definitely center the voices of black people and currently and formerly incarcerated people in the research that you are doing. Um, but that's just my two cents. Thanks for watching. Peace.